Can you hear me? And we had a choice. We could wait till the appointed time or I'm looking at people in the room. We could start now and get you finished early. That means you can either enjoy the networking reception and some beer and wine or you can go home, whatever suits you. So we chose to go with now. Um, my name is Alan Sweeney. I'm the segment manager for Europe for Camphill. We're an air filtration company. I've been with the company quite a while. Um, I've spoken at this event frequently. Today, I'm going to discuss uh, high temperature filtration. With the increasing demand for vaccines and injectable products, standards associated with manufacture of those products have changed, and high temperature filtration is an area that's been used for many, many years um, by Camphill and other competitors to manufacture filters that are a little bit different to the norm. So I'm gonna go through what's different about them, where they're used, and the, as I say, the ups and downs, the, the, the highs and lows of high temperature filtration. Because as anybody who is anyway mechanical minded knows, as you heat or cool something, you get expansion and contraction. That's a nightmare for a filter that you're expecting to pass down to 99.9997 or above. So it's not easy to make a filter that can expand, contract, and change during the life it's been used. Prior to that, because it is standards, um, I just said I'd talk briefly about a new standard, not directly related to clean room design, but directly related to indoor air quality and any design of a building that's gonna bring air inside. So it will affect clean rooms. For many years, when we talked about clean rooms, other than in the semicon industry, we spoke about dust and microbial contaminants. We didn't really talk, unless it was a very critical application or it was gonna damage somebody's health, about molecular filtration. Molecular filtration will, will now, um, my colleague in the room, Mr. Hughes can correct me if I'm wrong, by the end of the year, uh, Q4 2023 and Q1 2024, the two standards that relate to design, ventilation design of buildings will be changed to incorporate this standard, which means fortunately or unfortunately, if you're designing an indoor occupied space, you have to not just consider the particulate matter or the clean room class, but also odor and potentially harmful chemicals. So I'm just gonna give a little brief introduction to that since we have some time, but I will still finish early, I guarantee it. Next question. Am I speaking too quickly? Clear enough, okay. That's unusual. So this is a big step for the use of molecular filtration. They've been black magic, the black art. We, molecular uh, filters would typically include various types of media. And rather than filter, they absorb or catch the odors or chemicals. How effective they were was really down to the supplier you chose and the exercises or tests he carried out. How efficient they were was the same. You're reliant very, very heavily on the supplier's data. This new specification will mean that there is a filter test standard to which a molecular filter must comply with. And it makes it much clearer than just a bit of a guess or a calculation based on your supplier's best guesses. It's a new ISO standard. It's a continuity of some standards that were out there. Technical Committee 142 uh, for cleaning equipment for air and gases had multiple working groups and they published this last year. As I say, it will affect standards like the Eurovent standard, some of the RAVA guidelines and ISO, what was EN 13779, it's now ISO blah blah. Somebody else with more knowledge can confirm it. But they're standards that are directly related to ventilation of buildings, to control molecular contamination because like everything else in the world nowadays, during our pandemic, we had reports on vi viral load, viral contamination. If you look at any of the publications that are out on the internet nowadays, it's talking about molecular contamination, ozone, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, toluene and VOCs. And they've been spoken about for many years, but never really regulated, other than on the exhausts of factories to protect people in the area. Not in the city, not in the school, not in the building, not in the clean room. Particulate matter, particulate matter, clean room classes, no 
molecular contaminants were really considered. Again, this will change. It means that this new standard will come up with a level of efficiency tested against known contaminants. So there's a test criteria written, we have ozone, nitrogen dioxide, and how efficient the filter will be, and it's classified in a similar way to the ISO 16890 standard, which classifies particulate filtration. But again, because it affects this ISO standard, it will affect EN 167983, Eurovent 423, the VDI standards, and all of the other standards that are directly related to the design of indoor environments, be it a school or a semicolon or a pharmaceutical plant. Q4 2023, Q1 2024, how quickly will it really be rolled into the industry? I'm unsure to say how compliant people will be. It's definitely a step forward for the industry um, and for people in buildings, but how quickly it will be rolled out will be interesting to see. Forgive me, this is not moving on for some reason. This is what it'll look like. It'll be a bit silly, but it'll either be a very light duty or a heavy duty solution. So it'll be a similar to either ISO course 30% in 16890 or ISO EPM 160%. But it gives clarity rather than just this is X, Y, or Z efficient at this compound and it will last well length of time. Much more clear, much more transparent for end users and specifiers to compare like with like, apples with apples. Before I go on, any questions on that standard? Because it was something I was asked to talk about earlier on. Any questions or interest? We'll put molecular, yes. <coughs> Force is a tough word. Actually, you can answer better. Again, it's, it's an extra stage of filtration. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on what side of the coin you look at, um, it will entail more pre-filtration. Because as I said earlier on, a molecular filter of whatever media is chosen, carbon or various chemically treated medias, they absorb from the airstream. You don't want them to be getting clogged with dust or the available absorption surface area is cut dramatically. So like protecting a HEPA, you'll have to protect them with a good particle filter. So it is another, so if you've got an existing system, again, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but where you remove one stage of filtration and put in the molecular stage, do you have to add on and retrofit? Being forced to use is probably a tough statement, but if it's legislation, it's meant to be done. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And guidance. Worker safe, wor not only worker, occupational, anybody inside a building. So any, us here today, it's, 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 for, it's ex expansive change. Say again, sorry. L last year, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's been driven directly out of, it's, it's pandemic did a lot of things for a lot of industries but it really raised the awareness of air quality because that was typically how water touch and it was spread by close contact, breathing, coughing, blah, blah, blah. All of these compounds were known to be hazardous and quite hazardous in, in fairly 
mediocre concentrations. But with the push and uh, awareness and interest in indoor air quality, this just went through that working group much quicker than I thought it was going to go through. And it is going to be a big change um, for molecular filtration. Yeah, you're okay. So now, we should talk about high temperature filtration. And again, we will be finished early. Um, what do we consider, and we've spoken at this conference many times about filtration and air filtration and what it is, but what do we consider high temperature filtration? For us and most other filter manufacturers, it's once the filter goes over about 120 degrees C. Up to there, standard filters are, are possibly suitable in most applications. Once it goes above that, we need to look at li something a little bit different. And because they're typically used in maybe in pharma, in static ovens, in food, in dryers, in, in again, pharma and vaccine production, sterilization tunnels, the filter is typically the last thing that the air will see before it cascades over a very critical product or vial for a product. So the filtration and the continuous passing of that filter to the relevant standards is critically important and it has been a problem for quite a number of years. As anybody here who tests filters will tell you, they are interesting. Because it's the last in the line and next is the product, they should probably also be reliable, or sorry, suitable for use with obviously critically low pressure drop, low energy consumption, longer life and less waste. That's what everybody wants. And that's a, that's a prerequisite for any filter you choose. But it should also be very free of things like bisphenol and phthalates. Uh, it shouldn't be degassing or putting anything else as, that could be a contaminant into the system. It should be maybe suitable for food contact. It should be definitely suitable for testing in a pharmaceutical environment with all, and I've said this many times at this conference, with all of the hydrogen peroxide and parasitic acid and ethylene oxide that you guys and girls clean systems with. Because I can genuinely remember getting many, many calls over the years, hey Sweeney, your filter's gone brown. What you do when you're testing it? No, no, we flooded it with two and a half thousand ppm's of bloody blah blah. When did you tell us you were gonna do that? We didn't. So it's critically important that there have some kind of compliance with what actually happens on site. But it's also critically important when it comes to injectable production. Because here you're dealing with vials that are going to be filled with a liquid in which will go into somebody's body. And that, again, you're talking at temperatures 350 degrees and over. The reason for that is, as we see here, to get rid of endotoxins that cling to glassware and plastics from which these vials are going to be made, they typically go through a wash, and I'll show you some pictures later. A wash first, then a drying area of a tunnel, then a high temperature area of a tunnel. Or they might be placed inside an oven. But you can see here that in sterilization, you can kill viables and bacteria at 130 degrees C over 24, or sorry, over two to four hours. When it comes to ovens, etc., you can do 180 degrees C to sterilize glassware over typically 18 hours, or 350 degrees C for minutes. Now, when it comes to productivity, loading millions of vials into an oven and leaving them in for 18 to 24 hours is quite a long production time. So typically, tunnels are used, two to three minutes, done. So the process is typically, you have a vial washing station, and here again, that's where we would have typically found molecular filtration sometimes used in pharma prior to the legislation. Because for worker safety, they could be washing with caustics or acids and those would give off noxious solvents, which are dangerous. So they might have had a research system on a sterilization room in a pharma plant, but typically not a lot of other applications. After the vial washing, it goes through a drying process and enters the HEPA filter zone. And then it's heated to 350 degrees C to sterilize and depyronidate, as we call it. It then, goes on to the hot zone, and that's where your HEPA filters are fitted, and that's where the vials go through on a production line for minutes, sterilized, dry, next station filled with whatever product it is, insulin or, insulin or a vaccine, packaged and into somebody's arm or bus or wherever they go. But unfortunately what happens, and this is why I said the ups and downs, 
Typically, these tunnels, and you can imagine keeping a tunnel at 350 degrees C, how expensive that is for plant operating costs. So typically, tunnel is heated during whatever number of cycles of production, and then it might be cooled down again, rather than keeping the high cost of keeping it at 350. What actually happens then is, typically the filters are installed, it's gotta be validated, 146443, initial integrity test, that's when it's fitted, and then it's gotta be done after it's been through some operation, so they ramp up between 20 and 350 degrees C, leave it for whatever their site standard is, a number of hours, ramp it down again, test again, expansion, contraction, and often, not always, whoops, there's a leak, and you've got to go through it again. And you're looking at 24 to 48 hours here. That's a huge cost for production, decrease in productivity, and a pain in the, you know what, for guys that have to hang around and test when they want to go somewhere else. So it's always been a problem. Or else, again, you get the production temp ramp up, they stay at a steady state of 350. Expensive, but some of our clients do it. Keep the tunnel operating at 350. Again, after six months, if it's depending on the grade, or a year, they revalidate. Oops, you've a leak. Now you've got to go back through, and if you don't have live monitoring, which they typically don't, when, did we, when were we out of conformance? Are X, Y, and Z batch compliant? Can they be used? It's always caused troubles in the industry. And again, the reason for it is that filters are made up of five main components. The frame, th the media, the sealant to hold the media to the frame, some way of separating it, which if you visit our stand, you'll see separators that we would typically use, be they aluminium, stainless steel, or uh, glue, basically, and a gasket. And in normal operations, once they're fi fitted, sorry, manufactured by Canfield or another manufacturer, the EN 1822, which we've discussed before here, they've got to be tested, get a unique serial number, and they're fit for purpose. Then they're tested when they go to site. Regular application, no changes, they'll last years upon years upon years. Bring in expansion and contraction, and you're changing the parameters of what's happening in that filter every day. We have the problems that I've spoken about there very briefly. When it comes to high temperature filters, what's special is typically between the frame and the media, there might be a compensation mat, there might be a temperature resistant ceramic glue. The filter pack is typically similar, glass fiber media and aluminium or stainless separators. It ain't gonna be glue because it's gonna melt. And then we can often reinforce the frame for certain OEMs or make some other additions. Still a filter, it's only an air filter, but it's a hell of a lot more complicated to manufacture and a hell of a lot more tricky to test for the guys who do so. So the idea is tried over the years to improve the industry. And, and believe me, Canfield and all quality filter manufacturers genuinely want the filters to last as long as possible. The idea of a filter sales guy in any company wanting to change filters every three months or four months or once a year, they're gone. That's, that's, that's yesterday. We want them to last as long as possible, be as compliant as possible and as safe as possible so that we're a profitable company or competitors and you guys have a good service. So the ideas that were tried over the years to improve the high temperature filter in its various guises were stainless steel mesh as the media, get away from the standard glass fiber and other medias that we would have used, reinforcing bars, reinforcing frames, trying to hold it from expansion and contraction. This is a typical glass fiber, but here it might last, pressure drop is high, and you ain't getting any change of about six and a half thousand euros. Now I don't mind if you want to pay six and a half thousand euro for a HEPA filter, but I don't think it would be phenomenally popular. But it was tried and it worked in various guises, good and bad. Other things, and this is a Canfield idea, we came up with ceramics. So glass fiber media still, ceramic frame, ceramic sealant, which was less prone to expansion and contraction. Some of our competitors copied this and we've all had good results with that type of filter, but it has its issues. Because as I said during the, what happens is, when the filter goes in first and it's shipped to size, it's tested in our factory, tested initially, but then when it's heated, the binders and other items that we would have, would have added to keep the filter stable will burn off. And that's the reason for the ramping up, leaving it in production, ramping down, to get rid of some of the filter components. 
And even with this thermic field, you had to do that. So that was still a production issue or a, or a productivity issue. It had to be ramped up, it had to be kept at steady state, it had to be cooled down. And it's during that process that there was a, that there was a potential for problems. And then other manufacturers, very briefly, it's just a handful range of HT filters, lower what we use in the sealant, typically PU, as it goes through, it becomes silicon, then ceramic. The frames are typically metal or plastic on your regular HEPA filter. As you go through, you go through metal and stainless steel or ceramic on high temperatures. So you can see the progression in glass fiber media, glass fiber high temperature media. So as the filter temperatures increase, what we've got to manufacture to, and competitors have got to manufacture to, increase. So that was our way of trying to solve the problem by designing filters fit for certain temperatures, reinforcing or changing to ceramics, etc. The failure issues typically were after you heat and cool, you ended up seeing cracks in whatever compounds were used. And like anybody who knows that test filters, cracks equal failure, be it the media, frame, or uh, the sealants. And to stop that from happening, because again, productivity, costs, revalidation, some manufacturers, um, a number of OEMs, Bosch, Syntagon now, EMA, Bosch and Strobel, came up with what they call the dynamic seal. So, filter, raised on spacers, positive and negative pressure, so that some of the clean HEPA filtered air was going out, so that when the, unit was, the filter was tested, typically where the fails were, were, are over here in the potting compounds, and that wasn't picked up and was passing. And they're a good tunnel. They have some size constraints for some filters and they might, they might be fixed in what you can do, but it was, a, it was a, a good way to look at a solution for this ongoing problem. And then the market came back to Canfield and other manufacturers and said, hey, buddy, what if the product could be extremely stable at a high temperature? What if the product could give consistent ISO 5, which is what they want, over the tunnel lifetime, or even a higher efficiency? What if the product could be cleaner, ramp up faster, and deliver better yield ultimately for their production? So Canfield and some other manufacturers invested a lot of time and a lot of money, and we took a good input from, we hired some pharma colleagues and they went into our R&D facilities. In development of new materials, new solutions that would be compliant with the industry for being close to such critical products. The development consisted of multiple testings in our own ovens and tunnels that we bought, multiple runs, many, many data points, to try and achieve a filter that we could get up to comfortably 200 or more cycles, so production cycles, cycles ramping up and ramping down without failures, and we can comfortably do that. I'm very sorry, we're, we're ahead of schedule, so forgive us. But you can have the slide set if you wish, and that might make up for it. Um, and that's what we wanted to achieve. You've got to bear in mind that 200 cycles is 200 production runs. It could be a day or it could be a week, so it's quite a long time. Um, typically, and we supply a lot of the big manufacturers, and they can control ramp up of temperature very easily. But unfortunately, cooling down is not normally. Turn off the switch for the tunnel, and it ramps down. Before it does that, it can often spike up from 350 to 400 degrees for a number of minutes or hours, because you've no airflow, you've no fan on, so the temperature can actually increase. So as well as that, we wanted to make sure that we could hit 400 degrees for a period of time without having the failure, the dreaded failure. So again, lots of development, lots of items bought to do it. Test, did it pass? Yes. So. It's not a new product anymore. We came up with it about four, five years ago now. It's been embraced by the industry. It's called Absolute Deep Pyro. It's a H14 high temperature HEPA in standard sizes, in a range of standard sizes. And that's critically important because during the changes in all of our iterations over the years, Canfil and other manufacturers tried 78 and 100 mil and other sizes to make them stronger, which meant that we had to supply, comp us and other people had to supply compensating frames, because most of these filters are going into a tunnel that takes a six by six by maybe 150 deep or 292 deep. So we introduced another frame, stainless steel, which then led to perhaps some contraction and expansion issues. So these are 
made in standard sizes to suit the standard tunnels that are typically out there. H14, up to 350 degrees, 400 surge. Important that when they're mounted, I had a good conversation with a colleague of mine outside, sorry, a friend of mine outside earlier on. It's important that they're mounted with the filter separators standing in an oven. Because again, with temperature, things can, but I guess there's, there's devices available and it's been a phenomenally well-received new filter in the industry. And then we thought about, again, we deliver it to your site. It arrives on site. It's handled by people who are very, very experienced in filter fitting or filter testing. It's going into a clean room. And typically it was packaged in a cardboard box with a plastic liner. And you would, they would just remove the filter from the box in the liner, bring it in, and maybe bang it off a door or bang it off. So we've now made the packing suitable for bringing it into the clean room. Just a little tweak, but again, it's proved phenomenally successful in cutting down on damage before installation. So a very quick summary of the benefits of this product. It was the first consistent H14 to achieve ISO 5 in a tunnel on the market. Zero emissions, zero tempering, zero cleaning was needed. Because there was zero tempering, there was no emission from the filter during ramp up, so then there was no need to clean the tunnel before you went into production. Zero thermal waste, because you don't have to keep the tunnel at 350 degrees or 300 degrees or whatever your production temperature is. You can turn it off, let it ramp down, and not worry about the startup again. Sorry, again, you've just joined. We started a bit early, but I will give you the slides to the presentation um, so you can look at it at your own leisure with a glass of wine or beer, whatever your choice. It's pro safe and reach compliant because again, it is the last point that the air is gonna go through before it hits some fairly critical products. Okay, we patented this because we wanted to protect our few quid, so let's be clear. But it really is better than a lot of competitors out there. And that's the end of the sales pitch. It is 10 times more efficient, peak temperature is 400 degrees, max pressure is 700, which shouldn't happen. It shouldn't see such a rise in pressure drop at all because it's a, in a clean process in a clean room that's recycling clean air. So the pressure shouldn't increase. But if it does happen and something goes wrong, it can go to 700 without bursting. No outgassing at all, very durable, to, to over 200 cycles. And certified, again, ability for indirect fuel contact, food contact, microbiologically inert, and no chemicals that will outgas during your production process. I won't go through them all, I have already. Um, if anybody is interested, we have some samples outside we can show you. Uh, it was a tough, tough, tough nut to crack. Now making a filter that we could guarantee in any way in high temperature was, was difficult, very difficult. Pleased to say we did it. I hope, and we have had some good take up, so it has added to our portfolio. It fits between what we would call our F4K and our thermic fill. This is typically for old installations where space are limited, and this is for, uh, for all old installations and any new installations. This filter is suitable. It's been tested by all the major OEMs. And forgive me. What it will do for an end user, if it's chosen, is it will increase productivity, ensure the production area is kept under the highest efficiency possible in the market. It will be leak free with the different gasket options. It will still work with the dynamic gasket, as I call it, those ovens, but it will make them less necessary. And we've had a really, really good up uptake by both end users and all of the major OEMs. So I hope if anybody is familiar or on our site is manufacturing insulins or vaccines and are having these issues, you will please contact myself or any of our local team in whatever country you're from, and we can try and help you solve this ongoing problem. Thank you very much. And now we can get out to the networking event. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. that's okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Test again. Uh, no yeah, yeah. <laughs> Expansion, contraction. The filter has changed. Yes. We tried, a lot of manufacturers tried that. Make it a little bit less efficient, knowing that when it was burnt in with the expansion, it would seal these leaks. Mm -hmm. 
but then you had to go through a testing company or a validation regime that would allow you to do that. Because normally if it fails on the first, they're not going to go through the ramp up, ramp down procedure. Unless they've been told specifically, we expect it to improve. But it's not a normal. Okay. We thought about that, but it didn't go that way. Mark B, so B, B fails the first time. Yes, okay. yes. And again, it's, un it's unusual for that to be allowed to try to ramp up and down unless there's specific instruction. But it wasn't a camper filter, so thank you very much. <laughs> Any anybody else? Tim? Oh, it's going to get hard now. Here we go. You're still, you're still passing the filter to ISO 46443. Same regime, same test methods. Test is cold, and that's the problem. We have had a number of validation companies try to test them hot and run their gases, aerosols, and the particles through cooling and stuff. Difficult to do, expensive to do, and a pain in the ass, believe me. But typically, it's tested cold. No, unfortunately not yet. Not that we won't, but not yet. Yeah. We have we put it we put it in the oven. That's our longest step in production is it goes into an oven for 24 hours. Anything that is yeah, because we don't need it. It's just the binders and stuff that we burn off are inherent in the manufacture of other components. We don't need it for filtration efficiency, but it was always needed for stability. Because you've improved the construction, we can get rid of it and ship it, and it doesn't change. And that's been a huge saving grace. Pain in the ass for us because of the big heating bill and whatever. But that helps. Anybody else? Right, we're finished early. Thank you very much. I if you didn't see or hear the full presentation, please just ask me. Information is free. Slide set is free. And the same for anybody else in the room. Thanks, ladies and gents. Voila. Thanks. Thank you.